Hello, everyone. You're watching Inside the Americas. Coming up, Senator Raphael Warnock wins his runoff election in Georgia, cementing the outright majority for Democrats in the upper house of Congress. As high stakes UN talks on biodiversity get underway in Montreal, we'll take a closer look at the crisis surrounding the monarch butterfly in Mexico. And we'll go to Cuba, a country famous for its boxing. Coming up, Cuban women celebrate a new decision allowing female boxers to compete for the very first time. I'm Jeannie Godula. We'll start first in the U.S. state of Georgia, where Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock defeated Republican challenger Herschel Walker in a runoff this week. It was the final Senate seat left undecided from the 2022 midterms. And while the Democrats already held the majority, Warnock's victory now gives the party an outright 51-seat hold on the Senate. It's also a symbolic win for the Democrats as Warnock beat Donald Trump's hand-picked candidate, Herschel Walker. Leo McGuinn takes a closer look back now at the Georgia senator's life and career. I want you to... From pastor to senator, that is the reality of Raphael Warnock's career. The native of Savannah, an eastern Georgia city, had to do it the hard way. Born into a family with 11 siblings, he was raised in public housing. He was also the first in his family to graduate from college. His father, a World War II veteran, was a Pentecostal pastor during Warnock's youth. Following in his footsteps, Warnock also joined the church as a pastor eventually gaining a senior position in the church where Martin Luther King served in Atlanta. Fast forward to 2020, Warnock decided to run for Senate for the very first time, presenting himself as the minority's choice. I'm going to support relief for ordinary people, for struggling people, for folks right now who are literally facing eviction, and, that you will and in January of last year, at the age of, of 51, on which he became the first black senator in Georgia's history. This time round, as he seeked re-election, he was able to count on strong support from a few famous faces, not least former President Barack Obama. Let's make this happen, Georgia. I love you. God bless you. Let's finish the job. Warnock's long-awaited victory on Tuesday night is particularly significant for the Democrats and gives Joe Biden and his party a 51 to 49-seat majority in the Senate. Climate activists and global leaders are in Canada this week at the United Nations Biodiversity Summit. That conference is hoping to set goals to halt the loss of nature over the next decade. And scientists are urging governments to avoid trade-offs between humans and conservation. Case in point, monarch butterflies now on the endangered species list. El Rosario in Mexico is the world's largest sanctuary for monarch butterflies, but defenders of the species are facing increasing environmental and security threats, as Quentin Duval reports. At an altitude of 3,800 metres, visitors flock to admire the spectacle. It's here, among these pine trees, where the monarch butterflies form their colonies. But today, they're not going far due to the weather. Remember, the butterfly flies if there is sun. If there's no sun, it won't fly. The Rosario Sanctuary receives 60% of the migratory monarch butterflies arriving in Mexico. It is an essential refuge for preserving the species. But the butterfly's protectors sometimes put their lives at risk. We try to do the best we can, but yes, like any job, there's a risk. Yes, possibly. Possibly. I can't tell you more. In this state, plagued by insecurity, environmentalists are also targets of organized crime. In January 2020, Homero Gomez, the manager of Rosario Sanctuary, was found dead in disturbing circumstances. In Michoacán, the habitat of the monarch butterfly is threatened by increasing deforestation for avocado farming. So a few kilometres from the sanctuary, a village has decided to monitor its forests 24-7. It's a very difficult and risky job. There are a lot of people involved in illegal tree cutting and sometimes they come carrying weapons. Despite the risks involved, the whole community is trying to fight illegal logging and is planting new trees every year. 
efforts which are now paying off. At the moment, we're seeing that we have monarch butterflies inland, and it's great because it reflects the work we're doing, the conservation of our forest. It's a source of pride. We should feel proud to have this opportunity. The monarch butterfly is also impacted from Canada to Mexico by the use of pesticides. Since the 1990s, the estimated decline in population of this species has been between 22 and 72 percent. Let's take a closer look now at what's been making headlines this week across the Americas in Jamaica, Honduras and Colombia. Honduras is following in El Salvador's footsteps, having decided the best way to crack down on gang violence is to suspend constitutional rights in large parts of two major cities and send the police in en masse. Today we're officially launching an operation which falls within the state of emergency in neighborhoods and suburbs that we've identified as having the highest population of criminal organization members. Twenty thousand police and military are moving into poor urban areas to make arrests without warrant, after public pressure to crack down on drug traffickers and gang members who are responsible for a soaring rate of homicides. Dealing with its own gang crisis, Jamaica has also declared a widespread state of emergency. The measure applies to parts of the capital, Kingston, as well as six of the island's 14 parishes. There are those of us who live in a dream world, or maybe they are trying to trick the population who may not uh, be aware of the situation. But I live in the world of reality, and the reality is that there is organized criminal violence that is at a level that threatens the state. Police will be able to arrest people and search buildings without a warrant. This has been criticized by activists and political opponents who warn there could be abuses of power and mass detentions. So far this year, there have been almost one and a half thousand killings on the island of around three million people. A mudslide on Sunday in central Colombia swallowed a bus and hit two other vehicles, killing 34 people. The rainy season that began in August is Colombia's worst in 40 years, causing accidents that have left more than 270 people dead. The country has declared a national emergency over the heavy rains, which it's linked to La Nina, the weather phenomenon which has lasted an exceptionally long time this year. This week, Argentina's Vice President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner was found guilty of public contracts fraud. It was the first time a vice president from Argentina has been convicted of a crime while in office. The case, known as Vialidad, has been extremely high profile, but as Vedica Bahel explains now, there's little chance the VP will serve jail time. In federal court in Buenos Aires, a final decision has been made on the fate of Argentina's vice president. Cristina Elizabeth Fernandez de Kirchner is sentenced to six years imprisonment and lifetime disqualification from holding public office. It marks the end of a long, high-profile corruption trial for Cristina Kirchner, who's been charged with fraudulent administration. Whilst charges of running a criminal organization were dismissed, she was found guilty over irregularities in public contracts during her two terms as president between 2007 and 2015, alleging she'd funneled money into a construction magnet friend, causing a state loss of $1 billion. Kirshner, however, has vehemently denied all accusations and was quick to defend herself, saying she was the victim of a political witch hunt. It is not lawfare nor judicial. This is a parallel state in mafia, a judicial mafia. Kirshner, however, is unlikely to serve any prison time due to governmental immunity, and she's expected to continue in her post and launch a process for appeal that may take years. 
The case has been divisive in politically polarized Argentina, and her supporters took to the streets post ruling to show their solidarity. World boxing powerhouse Cuba has allowed women back into the ring after a decades-long ban. The new rules paved the way for the first-ever Cuban women's team at the Central American Games in San Salvador next year. The announcement comes six months after Cuba's male boxers made a comeback in Mexico, competing professionally and getting paid for the first time since the communist government prohibited professional sports 60 years ago. Catherine Kadir Clifford and Florence Gaillard report. A rush to the ring in Havana, as the government announced Cuban women are officially allowed to participate in boxing matches. It's an important step, which takes into account the recommendations of the International Olympic Committee and the International Boxing Federation. Cuba couldn't keep lagging behind. The decision comes following several 2019 reforms aimed at wiping out discrimination against women. After decades of waiting, Cuba's female boxers will no longer need to migrate in order to participate at the highest level of their sport. I'm so happy. I've been waiting for this. I want to have a sporting career as a boxer, to give my best, make sacrifices and to win a medal. With 80 world and 41 Olympic titles, Cuba is a leading boxing nation and the new rules mean new ambitions are possible. If everything goes well, I could represent my country in an Olympic, in the Pan American or Central American Games. We'll see if we can contribute as many titles as the male boxers who have brought so many medals for the Cuban delegation. 42 will face off in mid-December for 12 sports on the new women's team, which will then compete in the Central American and Caribbean Games in El Salvador, their first international debut, a step on the road to the 2024 Olympic Games in Paris. That's all the time we have for this Inside the Americas. We'll see you again next week for all the news from north to south. Special events. The Titans will clash in Qatar. The world's best players battle for the World Cup. from November 20th through December 18th. Don't miss World Cup news daily on France 24 and France24.com.